Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our online information and support session. My name is Kathleen Helgeson and I'm the coordinator of the Patient and Family Resource Center. I'm happy to welcome back Dr. Devinder Jassel, Section Head of Cardiology at St. Boniface Hospital, who has returned to share his expertise on the topic of heart health and cancer treatment and to answer your questions. We are very pleased to offer this session with the generous funding support of the Cancer Care in Manitoba Foundation. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we're meeting from all regions in Manitoba, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, and Dene people, as well as the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. It's important for us to foster inclusion and reconciliation and encourage others to do the same. Before we continue, there are a few basic Zoom features I'd like to explain. You'll notice as an attendee, your microphone and your video are turned off. If you have a question for Dr. Jassel at any time during the presentation, just click on the Q&A icon on your screen and type your question. You can also choose to ask that question anonymously by checking the send anonymously box before you click on the blue arrow to send. My coworker, Ali, is also here off screen and will be helping manage your questions as they come in. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jassel to you. He was born in Thompson, Manitoba and graduated from the University of Manitoba in 1998 with an MD. He completed a clinical and research fellowship at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Jassel joined the University of Manitoba in 2006 as an academic clinician scientist, where half his time is devoted to patient care in the coronary care unit and the other half and cardiac imaging, I'm sorry. And the other half is devoted, devoted to translational research. Among his many accomplishments, Dr. Jassel is a recipient of numerous awards in research and has authored over 350 peer-reviewed uh, publications. Welcome back, Dr. Jassel. Kathleen, thanks so much. Uh, really excited to uh, be back again in the virtual world here and looking forward to our conversation over the next hour. That's great. Yeah, it's great to have you back. I mean, we got such uh, good feedback. Uh, last year when you had joined us that we felt it was important to offer this information again. So for those of the, um, our audience that are, are new um, and joining us this year uh, for the first time, could you tell us a little bit about how the cardio-oncology uh, clinic was established? Sure. So uh, after I had finished my training in that small university called uh, Harvard, as you mentioned in Boston back in 2006, I was very fortunate to come back to Winnipeg and uh, set up shop here at St. Boniface Hospital. At that time, I was doing uh, both clinical and research in the field of what's called cardio-oncology. So cardio basically means heart, oncology means cancer, and the worlds of both cardiology, heart health, as well as cancer actually overlap, such that when patients are receiving treatment for their cancer, whether it's chemotherapy, which is medications you will get through your IV that helps kill the cancer cells, whether it's radiation therapy, which is used to shrink the um, cancer itself, whether it's these new immunotherapies that people are getting for their cancer. These are great medications, radiations that is useful to shrink the cancer cells. The one thing we must remember, however, is that the heart is at the center of the body. My dad's a mechanic, and I always explain that the heart is basically a pump. It's like the engine in your car. And so as the heart is getting um, these exposure to whether it's the chemotherapy, the immune therapy, targeted therapy, which many of you have received or uh, uh, have survived from the cancer and the radiation, it can cause injury to the heart at the same time. And so what I've done is I've set up a cardio-oncology clinic at St. Boniface Hospital since 2006. So I've been here now for 17 years. I've probably seen close to about 3,000 patients over the past uh, two decades, mm -hmm. where any patient who's seen at Cancer Care Manitoba, whether it's at Health Science Center, St. Boniface, Victoria, anywhere in the city, whether it's in Brandon or our rural sites as well, as the patient is receiving their chemotherapy and radiation and the cancer is going away, excellent. If for any reason the patient starts developing any issues with their heart, so they may be developing pains in their chest because they have blockages that are developing. They may have fluid on their lungs and they're having problems breathing because there's injury to the heart from the chemotherapy. That's where I come in, where the cancer specialists, our nursing colleagues, our physicians will send the patients to me and say, hey, 
Dr. Jassel, would you mind seeing this patient? I need your expertise. And then I see the patients here at St. Boniface. We work collaboratively with our cancer colleagues and teach patients that although you may have been cured from the cancer, we've traded one disease for the other, and now you may have some issues with the heart, and I'm here to help you out with that. So that's how we created the cardio-oncology clinic in 2006, and we're very strong here 17 years later. Yeah. And I think we're very grateful that you decided to return to Winnipeg and the Univers University of Manitoba. It's great that you that you were able to do that. So um, you referred to your your father just now as a, a mechanic, but you've also referred to yourself as a photographer. Could you explain a little bit what you do as a photographer? Sure. So mm -hmm. when we think of heart doctors um, as a cardiologist, my dad, as a heavy duty mechanic, says to me, anytime you talk to a patient or you meet with individuals, try to explain it in layperson's language that they can leave your office and they understand exactly what you said. So when you look at a heart doctor, we take care of the heart. Obviously, the heart is the muscle that sits inside your chest. And as the head of cardiology, I have 31 heart doctors that work at St. Boniface. We break them up into individual groups. So those doctor colleagues of mine who deal with heart attacks, I call them the plumbers because they'll be putting wires into the pipes of your heart to open up any blockages. I have then my electricians, and so if you decide to pass out and I have to put a pacemaker in you, my electricians would put a pacemaker in you. I have the mechanics, and those are my heart transplant doctors, so if your heart fails altogether and you need to have your heart taken out and put a new engine back in, those are my heart transplant doctors. And then finally, I'm a photographer. So what I do for a living is we have an ability to take pictures of your heart. So any patient who's on this uh, Zoom today, if you've received a specific chemotherapy drug called doxorubicin, uh, it's basically a red uh, chemical. We call it the red devil, if you will. I'm aging myself, but if people remember Kool-Aid back in the day, it looks like a red Kool-Aid solution in the bag. That doxorubicin, which we often use for patients for leukemia, lymphoma, they may have breast cancer, great for killing the cancer cells but it can damage the heart. So any patient who's getting doxorubicin will always get a picture taken of their heart to see how the heart is pumping. Either, Kathleen, they'll have what's called a MUGA scan, M-U-G-A, or they'll have an echo. An echo is just an ultrasound of the heart. And the purpose of these tests is just to look at the heart to make sure the heart is squeezing. Normally, the pumping function of the heart should be about 60%, so you should have a six-cylinder engine. Mm -hmm. And... As the patient is getting the chemotherapy, if they start saying doc to the cancer doctor specialist or the nurses, you know what? I'm feeling short of breath. Um, my feet are swollen. I can't climb up a flight of stairs. My belly is tight. I can't get my belt on. This makes the cancer doctors and nurses concerned because maybe they're retaining fluid. And so when they do the repeat imaging, which is what I do of the MUGA scan or echo, and it shows your pumping function has gone from six cylinders down to two cylinders. Now we know that you've had some injury to the heart and you'll come to myself. So that's what I do as a day-to-day -day photographer is we use special testing of a MUGA, an echo. And then the third thing, which we do at St. Boniface, which is very unique, is we do what's called an MRI of the heart. So you go into a very round donut, makes lots of loud noises, but it gives you some exquisite details of the heart that can help me as a heart doctor help you as the patient make sure that your heart can rebuild itself. Okay, great. Um, so you mentioned that that patients are typically referred to you by their cancer care team. Is that right? Correct. So yeah, the cancer care physicians, when they see and they get their MUGA scan results back or the echo for the patient, it shows that the pumping function has dropped from the six cylinders down to say two to two and a half. They'll stop the chemotherapy or the radiation. They'll send a referral to myself. And then I will arrange for that patient to come and see me in my clinic at St. Boniface so that we can work collaboratively with the patient and our cancer care team to figure out how do we make sure that the cancer goes away for sure, but also I want to make sure that I can rebuild the heart if it's possible. Okay. I'm going to just uh, take this moment then to, to launch a poll <clears throat> to our audience because I, I would like to hear from our audience about whether this is um, a topic that has um, been discussed with their cancer care team um, in terms of their heart health and the possibility of a potential um, heart disease following treatment. So I've just launched the poll and um, we'll give people a minute to respond to that. 
maybe just uh, while we're <clears throat> waiting for it, that um, Dr. Jasso, if you could just explain, I guess, why you got into this uh, field of work in particular, like what was there um, new research around the time that, that, you know, in the early 2000s, or when did people begin to sort of recognize that there, or that there was a correlation between heart disease and cancer treatment? You know, I think it's a great question. I, I can share with you that when I had finished my training at medical school here and back in 1998, and then went off to Halifax Dalhousie to become a heart doctor before going to Boston, in the early 2000s, when I was out in the Maritimes, we were starting to see patients who, which I call uh, cancer survivors. And so this, an example would be a 28-year-old mom who comes and sees me, two kids who are six and four, and she has a diagnosis of lymphoma, which she had when she was 12 years old. So she's 12 years old. She had survived her cancer and had received chemotherapy with the doxorubicin. She received the radiation when she was a teenager and had survived that. But now she comes to me a decade later uh, in her 20s, and she's short of breath. And we think to ourselves, okay, why would a young 20-year-old have water on the lungs and have such a weak heart when we do the pictures of the heart? And then when you go back to the history and you find out, well, she had received this chemotherapy years ago, a decade ago. That's when the world of cardio-oncology was starting to be created because we as heart doctors were starting to see this, people surviving their cancer, and you're trading one disease for the other, where now they're coming to us in their 20s, 30s, and 40s with injury to the heart. And so that's where I learned about this new evolving field of cardio-oncology. And really one of the reasons, Kathleen, that I went to Harvard and Boston, because I knew that this was a specific niche expertise that I could learn in Boston, knowing that I wanted to come back to Canada. And it was great that I had the opportunity to come back to the PEG and, and be here in Manitoba to help our patients over the past 17 years. That's awesome. I'm going to share the results of our poll with you right now. Could you see that, Dr. Jassel? Yeah, absolutely. Did you, yeah. Did you want to comment on, on, on those results? Yeah, no. So appreciate the uh, poll. So, you know, did uh, you ever discuss the heart health with your treatment team after your cancer diagnosis? No, it was not discussed and it was not discussed because not considered relevant. I think this is really illuminating for myself as a heart doc, because as I work with our cancer teams, I learn as much about cancer as, as much as I can share with my cancer teams about heart disease, because reality is when you look at the risk factors for heart disease, they're very similar to the risk factors that we have for cancer. Everyone has to remember on the Zoom call that the two leading causes of death in Canada is cancer and heart disease, right? Over 120,000 people will be diagnosed with one of the two diseases. Just in terms of statistics, Kathleen and myself are going to be chatting with all of you over the next 60 minutes, one hour. And if you think about it, Look at breast cancer, particularly one patient, one woman will be diagnosed with breast cancer every 20 minutes. So in three minutes, uh, sorry, three women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during our hour. If you look at heart disease, we know that one patient is going to have a heart attack every nine minutes in this country. And so we're going to have a total of about seven heart attacks during this one hour. And so when you look at risk factors for heart disease, and cancer, what are these risk factors? Smoking, we know smoking is bad. We've known all these years, our moms tell us don't smoke. They're right, right? Because those are risk factors, that's a risk factor. High blood pressure is a risk factor. Uh, diabetes from a heart disease perspective, sedentary lifestyle. So if you sit at home and you watch Netflix all the time, nothing against Netflix, they have great shows, but if you're not exercising five days a week, 30 minutes at a time, and have a sedentary lifestyle where you're sitting around all the time, well, these are risk factors, not only for heart disease and cancer. So am I surprised by the poll, Kathleen? No, I think more education is needed from the heart team and the cancer team talking to each other. And I think what's useful for patients, because at the end of the day, the reason we do this is all about patients, right? This is patient-centered uh, research, patient-centered clinical work we do. And now what I, I hope that uh, people can do, there's 82 participants today, is that share with your colleagues, your friends, your moms, your dad, family members about the fact that heart disease and cancer are related, that when you go see your heart doc, your family doc, you can talk to them about that. When you see your cancer doc, 
again, talking about the heart health, we should be talking about the whole patient as opposed to individual systems. Um, thank you. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those risk factors um, during this presentation. But there's a couple of questions um, right now. You mentioned about the MUGA and the ECHO um, tests that you can do. Someone mentioned that they're on a wait list for these tests, but there's a long wait time. Is that Has that been an issue? Is that a concern? Yeah. So I'll, I'll be frank. Welcome to the Canadian healthcare system. Mm -hmm. We do struggle with wait times and especially since we're coming out of the COVID pandemic, we are trying to play catch up for sure. I can say that in terms of the testing for the MUGA scan particularly, how it works in cancer care in Manitoba is, I know that they have the rule, I believe what's called 60, which means that once a family physician is concerned that you have cancer, you would be seen by the surgeon, you'd get a biopsy, you'd go see the specialist at Cancer Care Manitoba within that 60 days to be able to make the diagnosis so the treatment can start right away. If a patient is going to be started on doxorubicin, the red devil, the Kool-Aid, MUGA scans are done routinely at multiple hospitals in the city as well as Brandon. So a MUGA scan's wait period is very short. You can get that done within a couple of days, maximum two weeks if you need to. So there's not a, a large wait list for that. An echocardiogram, which is what I do in terms of the picture of the heart, the wait list is longer for that. That being said, though, if you feel that your wait list is too long and you're waiting, I'm going to say, say more than four weeks, six weeks, a couple of months, easiest for you to advocate by speaking with your cancer specialist, our nursing colleagues, our cancer care docs, your family doc, and say, I noticed I'm on a waiting list. I haven't got this appointment yet. And what they'll do is they'll advocate. I don't need phone calls from every single cancer specialist in the province because I am quite busy, but I'm happy to help facilitate it if it's in emergency for sure. Okay. Someone else um, had mentioned that they have finished um, treatment for having the red devil, the, that type of treatment. And she's um, suggesting, or should I be requesting a MUGA now um, that I've post treatment compared to my pre-trip treatment MUGA? So how far apart are those tests usually? A great she's question. Already finished treatment. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a great question. So for the specific question, if I take an example of a patient, a uh, young woman with breast cancer, uh, at baseline, before she gets any chemotherapy, we would do a MUGA scan or an echo. After she's finished the four to six cycles of the chemotherapy, which takes about two to three months, we would do another MUGA scan after that. And then if she's going to get another new medication, if there's women with breast cancer on this call or Zoom call called Herceptin, Herceptin is a medication we give every three weeks for a total of 18 treatments or one year. And in those patients, we would actually do MUGA scans sort of every three to six months. So MUGA scans are done quite frequently uh, to make sure, because you have to compare apples and apples. So you want to see, is the number the same before I started the chemo and then after? So the question is, if you did get the red devil mm -hmm. and your MUGA scan was done before that and your pumping function was normal and anything that's above 55 zeros normal, you should definitely have another MUGA scan ordered. If it hasn't been done by your healthcare team, you should advocate as a patient, whether it's that or an echo, just to make sure that the number is actually relatively the same and it hasn't precipitately dropped. Okay, great. So we've talked a little bit about breast cancer and um, are there other cancers and other types of treatment that are, are more correlated with heart disease than, than others. Like I know, I understand that you're saying that all cancers can be because the risk factors are often similar, but um, are there certain drugs with certain cancers that are more likely to lead to some heart issues? 100%. So yeah, let me give you three examples then. Number one is the most common scenario that I see, which is a patient with either breast cancer, lymphoma, or leukemia, Kathleen, and they would get that doxorubicin, that red devil. And what we do is we do the MUGA scan before and after their treatment. And if they start developing fluid on their lungs, their shorter breath, then I know that they've developed heart failure, which is water in the lungs will stop the chemotherapy. And then that patient would be started on medications to help improve the pumping function of the heart. So that's the ability of the heart to squeeze. That's scenario number one. Another example would be radiation. We're very good at radiation exposure or giving radiation to our patients in 2023, but back in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, so if you were a childhood survivor, you had lymphoma leukemia back then, we would give you a lot of radiation to the entire chest if you had cancer, obviously, in the chest. The heart is right there, as you could imagine. 
So what could happen, and I have another case, which is case number two, is that in your heart, Kathleen, you have what are called valves. A valve is a door that opens and closes. And if you think about it, it's sort of like the door of your office with the hinges. And what could happen with radiation is that it can damage the valve so that it doesn't close properly. It becomes a leaky valve or the valve is stuck and it doesn't open up properly. So I actually had my cardio-oncology clinic yesterday because I see patients on Tuesday afternoons here at St. P. And I have a very young 35-year-old who had radiation when she was in her uh, age 14. And the radiation had left her with a tight valve. She was quite short of breath. When I use my stethoscope, I can listen to what's called a heart murmur in her. And she ended up having to have the valve replaced. So we had to do open heart surgery, take up the valve that got damaged by the radiation and give her a new valve. So not only can chemotherapy, red devil, damage the pumping function of the heart as the pump, radiation can affect the valves itself. And a third common scenario that I see, if anyone has colon cancer uh, or have had exposure to colon cancer in the past on our call here, there's a drug that we use in colon cancer called 5 fluorouracil So it's called 5-FU. want to watch my language here, but that's what it's as in the acronym. So 5 fluorouracil It's a great drug for, again, colon cancer. The problem with this medication, it can cause twitchiness of your arteries. So on the heart, it's a pump. You have valves that open and close. And then on top of the heart, you have three blood vessels or three pipes. And if one of those pipes gets blocked, that's what I do day to day treating heart attacks because there's a blocked pipe. I'm going to take that patient to the operating room and I'm going to put a wire into the blocked pipe and open it up. That's called a stent. 5 fluorouracil which is using cancer patients for colorectal cancer, can cause twitchiness of these arteries and cause them to become quite narrowed. And a patient who receives this drug, it happens, how often? I see about five cases a year where the cancer team will say, hey, Dr. Jasso, patient has colon cancer. She's received 5 fluorouracil During the chemotherapy, she was having crushing chest pain that patient would be referred to me and I would see, and I would do my special imaging of the heart and see that they do have narrowing of the pipes. And we would actually fix that with a stent so that we can continue to give the chemotherapy. So as you can see that Kathleen, the chemotherapy and radiation not only affects the pump, can affect the valves. It can also affect the arteries as well. So it's all part and parcel. Mm -hmm. so, so we've talked about red devil and is that a group of is that an anthracycline? Is that, those are the types of drugs that that is? Correct. Yeah. So okay. anthracyclines is the class of drugs. So that's the umbrella that we use. Okay. And then the name of the drugs, whether it's called doxorubicin, ida, rubicin, epi, rubicin, anything that ends in ubicin is one of these anthracyclines. Okay. Correct. And then up, uh, in addition to the, the medication that you talked about for colorectal cancer, is there any other um, treatments that um, that have had research done where they show that there is a correlate that should, people could be aware of? Yeah, I think the newest kid on the block are these new immune therapies. So the immune therapies have come onto the market for the past five or 10 years. They're fantastic for curing cancers um, that we would not have been able to cure in the past. And what these immune um modulators or these immune cancer therapies have caused or do cause for the heart, very rare. Whereas the doxorubicin and the anthracyclines can cause up to one in four women developing injury to the heart. These immune modulators, which are the new kids on the block, only I see them about 1%, so one in a hundred. So I would say in 2023, I may have seen only five cases of these, but there are two important things that immune therapies can do. One, it can cause your heart to become irregular. So people will say, you know, hey, doc, I just got that medication and I feel that my heart is becoming irregular. I feel palpitations. My heart's racing. And if you're fortunate to have one of those fancy Apple watches or the Fitbits or you go to shoppers and you put your finger and check your blood pressure and they notice that the heart rate's a little irregular, that's one thing to think about, uh, whether this immune modulator has affected your heart rate and becoming irregular. The other thing that these things can do is it can cause inflammation of the heart. So how I explain to patients is, you know, when we get a cold and we have sniffles, we got muscle aches all over our body, right? We feel miserable, fever, chills, diarrhea, nausea, 
and you got muscle aches throughout the entire body. And the reason you get muscle aches is there's a virus that goes into the muscles that causes you to feel that you have a cold. Well, remember, the heart is a muscle as well. And so if the virus goes into the heart, it can cause you to feel weak and tired and fatigued. These immune modulators can go into the heart itself and cause the heart to become weak. It's a fancy word called myoheart carditis. Carditis is fancy for inflammation of the heart. But again, very rare, only 1% of the population gets this. And I rarely see it in my clinic. I often see more of the heart failure because of the red devil medication. Okay. Uh, one of the, the patients had written that they um, had had long-term effects from, um, or what asked, what are the long-term effects to the heart um, from the red devil treatment? And she was told that she shouldn't worry about her heart after treatment, but I feel well, but wonder how the chemo affected my heart. It sounds like that, that this person who had that treatment hasn't had those baseline tests or a follow-up test following treatment? Yeah, I, I would say that for sure, if you had the anthracycline, the the baseline MUGA scan is always done by all of our cancer teams. Okay. A follow-up should be done. And I would say 99% of the time, I've always seen it done as well because that's routine practice. I can mm -hmm. share, Kathleen, that uh, what we're noticing now is that the pediatric uh, oncologists, so those are the cancer specialists who deal with kids, Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm noticing is that if there are kids who are between the ages of, say, 8 and 17, because I deal with adult patients 18 and above, but ages 17, if they're having exposure, had any exposure to any of the anthracyclines, the red devil for lymphoma, Hodgkin's, and le leukemia back in their teenage years, at age 18, what will happen is I'll get a, uh, I'm starting to re get referrals from my pediatric kids cancer docs saying, hey, Dr. Jassel, we know you have this expertise. Would you mind seeing these, this patient just for follow-up? And what I've been doing in that case is when they hit the age of 18, I see them in my clinic. I'll do a, either an echo or a MUGA, just get a baseline value. And if it's fine, which 99% of the time it does because they're a young kid at 18, we're good to go. Rarely will I find some abnormality. And then in my practice, I tend to sort of do it every five years till they hit the age of 40. By the time they hit the age of 40, between 18 and 40, they get these MUGA scans or echo every five years and they're okay. I haven't seen in my practice that they're going to now have a heart that falls apart. There's always exceptions to the rule, but I think some kind of follow-up is important. And one take-home point to, the, um, to all the audience here is that you don't necessarily have to see a heart doc to get any of these fancy testing done, the MUGA or the echo. Our family physicians, GPs, our nurse practitioners... Um, they can all actually order these tests in the community. So if you had cancer in this past, you're a survivor, you don't see the Cancer Care Madoba doctors mm -hmm. teams anymore, you don't necessarily have to be seen by me. You can go see your family doc and say, hey, I came to a webinar. I heard Dr. Jastel talk about X, Y, and Z, or in this case, anthracyclines. And last time I had my MUGA scan was 20 years ago or an echo 20 years ago. Do you think it might be important for us just to recheck that? That's a test that any physician, nurse practitioner can order in this order. province. Okay. Yeah, good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, somebody else had written that they had CLL and received chemotherapy, also had a heart attack around the same time, and that um, that they had been diagnosed, but they now have a COPD fluid in the lungs. And um, this person writes, they're, it's, they're confused about what doctor to see about that, I guess. Yeah, no, it's a great point. So yeah. COPD, um, the fancy term for that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And so COPD is a disease that involves the lungs, uh, where you've had damage to the lungs, which can happen from radiation, can happen from chemotherapy. Most often it's from smoking uh, or environmental exposure. Say you worked with asbestos or you uh, deal with parrots and budgies, for example. There's lots of diseases, but when it comes to COPD, because COPD has the word pulmonary in it, which means lungs, my recommendation is to get seen by a, a lung specialist. Um, at the end of the day, when patients come to a family doc, to a GP, to a nurse practitioner and say, hey, I'm short of breath, I'm winded, the top three causes are going to be your he hemoglobin is low, your anemic, which means your uh, pooping up blood or you're peeing up blood, and then you would see a specialist to help figure out where you're bleeding from. That's number one. Two, you may be short of breath because of the heart. 
the heart is not pumping instead of the six cylinder, your two cylinder. That's where your family doctor, nurse practitioner will then refer you to a heart specialist like myself or one of my 31 colleagues that work at St. B here. Or we have up to 15 heart doctors who work in the community as well, Manitoba Clinic, Assiniboine Clinic, and so forth. Mm -hmm. If it's not your hemoglobin, if it's not your heart, the third thing is your lungs. And so COPD is a disease of the lungs where you've had injury to the lungs, smoking, again, the other causes I had mentioned before. That's where the can, um, your family doctor nurse practitioner will send you to a lung specialist. So you mentioned about radiation um, causing um, damage to the heart. So if you have radiation anywhere in your torso, is that potentially a risk or is it fairly targeted so that the heart's not affected? Great question. So back in the 1970s and 80s, when we used to give radiation, because we didn't know what side effects might happen, you know, 30 years down the road, we was we would just basically put radiation and zap the entire upper torso uh, if you had cancer throughout. Now with radiation um, and the base, the fact that we can dose it and make it very concentrated, we can put the radiation in certain areas just to make sure we're not getting the entire chest. And it, what's important from the heart perspective is your heart, which is the size of a fist. So I always tell patients, your heart is the size of the fist. It's always in the left side of your chest. So if you look at your left nipple, that's where your heart is located. So radiation on the right side of your torso, belly, not concerned. If it's over the left side of the chest, we are concerned. But our radiation oncologists, our radiation cancer specialist teams, they're so great now in 2023, where that if they do put some radiation um, towards the left side of the chest, the left torso, they're very cognizant and they know the fact that, oh, it could potentially affect the heart. And that's where they play an important role of working with our teams just to make sure that the heart's going to be okay. So, um, a question um, from somebody about exercise and, and weight gain, and, and this kind of is a good segue to talk about those risk factors and just uh, prevention for, for heart disease. Um, they, he mentions that he finished uh, prostate radiation and uh, also took hormone medication for several months and in that time put on 20 pounds during treatment. Um, he's asking about whether to diet, um, to reduce the weight to precancer level or to increase uh, exercise and also about the fatigue, of course, of, from the cancer itself, I guess, being an impediment. So any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, again, wonderful question. Uh, congrats if you survived the prostate cancer and that you're on hormone replacement therapy. When you say that you've uh, gained the 20 pounds, if the 20 pounds has happened over two or three days, like very quickly, that's always because of fluid buildup. So when patients come to me and say, hey, Dr. Jasla, I weighed 120 pounds yesterday, and two days from now, I'm 140, 150 pounds. Well, that has to be fluid because fluid or water builds up very quick. If it's more of a gradual, I've gained 15 or 20 pounds over three to four months, it's not likely fluid in that case. In that case, it's more likely the fact that you have more of a sedentary lifestyle. Um, so what I share with any patient, doesn't matter if you have heart disease, doesn't matter if you have cancer, common things are common. Exercise is so, so important. Super hard, obviously, in the city of Winnipeg, but with plus six degree weather in December, folks, you know, you need to get out there. Go to your shopping malls, go do walks and stuff. 30 minutes of exercise, five times a week, super important. I'm not asking you to run a marathon. I'm not asking you to go climb a mountain or anything. But if you do 30 minutes, five times a week, exercise is really important. Going back to the second thing about diet, Kathleen, eating healthy is important in terms of having your fruits, your fish, uh, particularly vegetables, You know, avoiding your fast food and going to McDonald's every day or going to KFC not the best in terms of diet. So again, eating healthy, exercising 30 minutes, five days a week, important. But the weight point is what I want to make sure everyone gets uh, is clear about is that if it happens over a couple of days, it's fluid. But if it happens over weeks to months, it's most likely from a sedentary lifestyle. So if it were that type of rapid weight gain, that would be a, an alarm, I guess, would it yeah. not be? Yeah, it, it would be. Much. But patients often were very noticing, right? They're going to be like, what's just happened? How come I can't get my shoes on anymore because my feet are so indented? What's happened to my belt now that I can't put my belt on because my belly has become quite swollen? But more importantly, is just the day-to-day -day activities. When they're walking in the kitchen, 
they're going to the mailbox, they're walking at Sobeys and doing their grocery stores. And if they are with their partners or their friends and they notice that they're huffing and puffing and having difficulties catching their breath, they will notice themselves, something ain't right here. I should go get some medical attention and make an appointment with my nurse practitioner, uh, my family doctor, my physician assistant to help figure out what's happening. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, I guess um, in the past, you know, when they weren't feeling well, when they when they were diagnosed with cancer, they felt that it was important to rest and, and to take it easy. And, and we often tell people to do that. But you're suggesting that we continue to exercise um, as much as we can, like that would be during treatment. I suppose if someone has had like heart surgery, obviously that there's going to be a, a gradual um, recovery from that physically. Yeah. So I think that's a good segue to the, the research that we're doing exercise, but let me talk about what's called uh, rehab and prehab. Okay. When a patient has a heart attack here at St. Boniface hospital, or if they have open heart surgery, every patient is automatically referred to the refit center on Taylor or the wellness over at Seven Oaks. And the reason that rehab is super important is that if they came in and they were watching Netflix all the time and not exercising, and they've had their heart attack and open heart surgery, the beauty of the rehab perspective is that patients will learn how to get into an exercise regimen, stop smoking, uh, eat healthy, and that's great for building their heart back up. That's called rehab. About 15 years ago, people thought of this idea called prehab, P-R-E-H-A-B. Why wait till I've had a heart attack? Why wait till I've had open heart surgery? Why don't I do things before I have an event happen? So when we have patients who have narrowing of the pipes and I know that they have to go for open heart surgery and you wait, say, six to eight weeks for open heart surgery here in our province, if it's not an emergency, we will send the patient to the refit or the wellness to have what's called prehab. Prehab means that we'll get you into an exercise program where you're working exercising before you go for surgery. And we know that these patients do exceptionally well after the surgery. So the pendulum is going from just rehabilitating everyone to see if we should do what's called prehab. So then let's segue then, if you don't mind, to our uh, research study, which is called the exact study, which we've been doing through the pandemic for the past three and a half years now. Uh, it's a study that I'm doing between Winnipeg and Halifax. My colleague, Dr. Grandy in Halifax, and myself here in Winnipeg, We've been doing the study for three and a half years, don't have the results yet. The enrollment finishes in December, but I'll, I'll share with you what the study is about. What we know is that if women with breast cancer are exercising and she is receiving chemotherapy and receiving radiation therapy, if they're exercising, there may be a possibility that their heart will be able to be less affected by the red devil compared to those who have a a lifestyle where they're sitting around watching Netflix, like keeping up to Netflix. I'll, I'll say Apple TV, I'll say Paramount <laughs> TV, others, Disney, Disney Plus. So what we've done in the past three and a half years is we have a total of 25 women here in Winnipeg, and we have about 20 women in Halifax, total of 45. We want to get to the magic number of 50. And it's very simple. When a patient gets diagnosed with breast cancer here at Cancer Care Manitoba, the nurses, as well as the docs, will ask the patient, are you interested in Dr. Jassel's exercise study? And if the, she says yes, they, my team will contact you. And then what we do is we do an ultrasound of your heart to see how the heart is pumping. And we do some blood work to see what your blood work looks like before you get any chemotherapy. Then we will divide you into two groups. One group is you can do what you want. You can exercise, you can do a sedentary lifestyle, and everyone gets a Fitbit. So here's a little plug that I give you a Fitbit for six months. The other group is actually getting exercise. So we teach you with a exercise physiologist. We give you uh, exercises so that you're increasing your heart rate and you're exercising, like I said, 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And what we do for six months is I'm tracking both groups. Yeah, the fit women with Fitbits who are doing their own thing may not be exercising. And those women who are exercising five times per week with their Fitbit, and I can watch you because I see your numbers. And then the plan is, Kathleen, after six months, we're going to, and they've received their chemotherapy, they've done, and they're, you know, cured from their cancer. 
the theory is that those women who are religiously exercising, are they less likely to have injury to the heart? That's what I want to prove. Okay. And so our last patient will be enrolled in our study. We're on December the 6th. We have another 19 days till Christmas. So we'll see if we have any additional patients. We'll get to the magic number 50. And then we'll have six month follow-up. So that will be in July of 2024 next year. I'll have exciting results and if you decide you want to invite me back again for fall of Definitely. next year, mm -hmm. I'll have some exciting results to share of what our exercise study showed. That's great. There, uh, there was a question about, is this uh, research age specific? No, I'm taking anyone over the age of 18, uh, over 18, and you're willing and interested in getting an ultrasound heart done before and six months after chemo, and I'm going to take some blood work on two separate occasions. That's what we're looking at. I'm not looking at any individuals uh, less than 18 because as an adult heart doctor, cardiologist, I look after patients 18 and over. Okay. Um, there's a couple more questions about medication, but before we um, go to that, can you talk a little bit about the other study that you've been involved in the CANFLEX study? Yeah. The other study, instead of the exact one, which is exercise, is called a CANFLEX study, which is looking at flax. So all of us know, or we've heard that if you get a couple of teaspoons, or tablespoons of flax and you put on your cereal or your yogurt every morning, it's good for your health, for your heart. My idea was that I want to see if flax will protect women's hearts when she's getting the chemotherapy, the red devil again. The problem in terms of how much flax you have to give is you'd probably have to give 32 tablespoons of flax, which no one's going to take that much tablespoon. So I reached out to my colleagues, um, Linda Pizzi. So they're called Pizzi Ingredients. They're a family owned business in Russell, Manitoba. And they're actually one of the world's largest producers, uh, Kathleen, of flax. And when we approached them a few years ago, we came up with an idea of, can we put flax into a, a beverage that you can drink? So flax milk, you know, when you go to Superstore or you go to Save On Foods and you have the non-dairy milks like almond milk, silk milk, and so forth. Well, they've created a flax milk product. And if you drink two glasses of this flax milk, which is what we did in a research study, it gives you about 30 of these tablespoons. So easy to digest. So what are we doing or what have we done? We have women who, before they get their breast cancer, uh, sorry, before they get the chemotherapy, and they're interested in the CANFLAX study, they'll come and see us again at St. Boniface. We'll do an echo and ultrasound of your heart, picture of your heart, and we'll do blood work. And then we're going to randomize you or give you into two groups. One is the group, which is called the Fruit Loops or the placebo, which basically means you're just going to get some oat fiber milk. The second group is called flax milk. We're going to give you the two glasses of the flax milk. And while the patient, she's receiving the chemotherapy, She's also going to be taking one of these two um, medications or not medications, but milk products. I, as the researcher, I have no idea what they're getting because it's all um, blinded to me. When I get the boxes from uh, Pizzi's, they're all in these brown paper cardboard boxes. I have no idea what the patients are getting. We have a total of about 30 women, Kathleen, who are in our research study right now. The FLAC study had finished enrolling all patients back in July of this year. And we're doing a one-year follow-up in all these patients as well. So July of 2024 is going to, next year is going to be a very busy year for me because I'll have results of both the exercise study and the flax milk study to see, one, does exercise help prevent the heart from having damaging effects from the red devil? And then from the canned flax, does two glasses of flax milk help protect the heart from the anthracyclines? More to come. Wow, that's exciting. And what is it about flax in particular that, that makes it good for your heart? Yeah, they're trying to figure out what it is about the flax itself. There's the specific um, um, antioxidants. It's a fancy word that basically says that that's how it works when you look it under a microscope on how it protects the heart. Still, people are trying to figure out how does flax protect the heart from the damaging effects. So let's first of all, see what the CADFLAX study shows, if it shows that it's beneficial. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna do more research to help figure out what is the component of the flax itself that will help it prevent damaging effects from the red devil. Okay, here's um, another good question. Someone had said they'd heard that flax contained a plant estrogen and was not recommended for estrogen positive breast cancer patients. Great question. 
I'm going to defer to my cancer specialist about that. I wasn't aware that flax is not uh, recommended in estrogen uh, positive patients. When I review the literature of women with breast cancer, uh, flax has been shown to be beneficial, not only for protecting the heart if we show that, but it's also been very useful for reducing your cancer size itself. But if you read or have been told by the cancer team that if you're estrogen positive and flax is not to be using that, please follow the expertise of the cancer docs. I would defer to them. Mm. A question about the um, flax milk. So you mentioned about how this is easier to digest. I know one of the common um, complaints people have about eating flax is bloating and, you know, that that they this occurs. And I did find that the flax milk is available through... Um, uh, Manitoba Mills, I believe it is now, and that's the Pizzy Farms that you mentioned. Okay. Yeah, so that it because the last time we spoke last year, I think you had mentioned that it might be available in the states, but I did find it on their website now, so that uh, that people can purchase um, it from from the Pizzy Farms. So, um, is it easier to digest, and does it cause the same amount of bloating? Is that something that you've heard about from the people engaged in the study, or? Yeah, I guess they don't know what they're taking, though, right? Whether it's flax or oat milk. Right. We don't know. We do have diaries for them to fill out if they feel any specific side effects uh, from the oat fiber and flax milk. So if they are, I haven't been hearing about it as the researcher. If they are experiencing it, I don't know if it's due to the oat fiber or the flax or more to come. And I think the one thing also is when I say it's flax milk or oat fiber milk, remember milk is used in quotation. There's no milk component there's no lactose or anything like this in there uh, we use the word milk because it's a liquid form so when you look at the flax milk or oat fiber milk it's constituent of oat fiber or the flax and then they use a water-based compound so that you can drink it and then it has textures vanilla flavoring and so forth so almost like a smoothie but there's no actual milk in either product so is it can I assume that if 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 the the research uh, results suggest that it is has a protective factor, having this flax, um, would that be applicable to all cancers? That it could have a protective, or to people in general, just in terms of general health, have a protective factor, uh, be a protective factor for the heart. I think that if the flax can flax study bred and born here in Manitoba shows that it's protecting the hearts from anthracyclines. I think personally it's going to be a game changer. Um, can we just then say, oh, everyone gets flax seed or flax milk? I don't think we're going to adopt it based on one study in Winnipeg. My next step, if it does show, is what we often do is we do what's called a local investigator initiated study. So fancy word meaning let's try it at one place. We're doing Manitoba because Pizzi's is our neighbors here in Russell. Let's see if it works here. And then once you've shown that it may work, either the exercise one or the flax milk, then you do a Canadian study where you get people across the country, not only breast cancer, but let's look at all cancer patients, leukemia, lymphoma, anyone who gets an anthracycline. And if we can give them flax milk and our numbers are not 50 people, but now we have a thousand people or 2000 and you put them in both groups and you show that the flax milk is beneficial. I think that's when things could potentially change Kathleen in terms of, you know, we're in 2023 and 2030 when a patient gets diagnosed with heart disease or a patient gets diagnosed with cancer, maybe our, our guidelines will change. And we're going to say, Hey, there was this guy in his fifties back in 2023 <laughs> who told us about this Canflex study. And now it's become part of uh, standard care. That's how, we make diagnoses and that's how we come treatment is all through research for sure. Yeah, that's great research. Yeah. Um, so some questions so that we hopefully can get to. Um, the heart Is the heart affected in patients with multiple myeloma from treatments for multiple myeloma? Great question. So in terms of multiple myeloma, I'll answer that two ways. Multiple myeloma by itself often doesn't affect the heart unless you have a form of myeloma called amyloid, A-M-Y-L-O-I-D. If you have multiple myeloma that turns into amyloid, amyloid can affect the heart and that's when the cancer cells will go into the heart itself. Myeloma by itself doesn't really affect the heart. So that's number one. Number two is the immunotherapies that I had mentioned, the new kids on the block. They're often used in myeloma patients. Again, very rare, one out of a hundred patients who have immunotherapy from myeloma can cause inflammation of the heart, causing the heart to be weak. 
I can tell you, like, again, I, I've been here for 17 years. I know immunotherapies have taken off in my Loma patients in the past four or five years. I've only seen one case. So very rare. Amyloid, if you have that type, can affect the heart. Immune modulators for my Loma, very rare, one in 100. Okay, thank you. Um, also, this person, uh, another person wrote, can ventoclax, ventoclax, is that right? For CLL, interfere with heart sinus rhythm. And what is this, or what what would this feel like? Is sure, right? sinus uh, you, rhythm. Yeah, I'll go to that. Can you? I'm just yeah. trying to look for the uh, thing. Can you tell me the spelling of that medication? Uh, I have it written down, or Ellie wrote it down. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, v e yeah. n e t o c l a x. Okay, thank you. I, I have not seen any issues with that medication causing um, your heart to become irregular. The fancy word that you said, normal sinus rhythm, that's just basically if you feel your pulse or you have an Apple Watch or Fitbit or you go to shoppers, normally everyone's heart should be regular and it should be between 60 is the lower number, 100 is the top number. So normal sinus rhythm is the fancy word saying it's between 60 and 100. Um, oh. Any medication can cause your heart to become irregular. Uh, and what you would feel as a patient is that you feel some skipped heartbeats uh, in your body itself, or if you feel your pulse, or you look at your Apple Watch or refit, there, um, your um, Fitbit, sorry, you will actually have an irregular pulse. So, does that medication cause it? I haven't heard of any, but those are the symptoms you'd feel. You'd feel a skipped heartbeat. So, is a skipped heartbeat? Is that like fibrillation? Is that like that flutter? Like that? Is yeah. that called? Yeah. yeah. So, that... yeah. So, it's uh, basically the heart. Not only is it a muscle, but it has an electrical system to its heart. So what I explain to patients is that you go to your washroom, you turn on the light switch, and you see that the light bulb is starting to flicker. We have an electrical system of our heart. There's the top part of the heart and the bottom part of the heart. And if either the top part or the bottom part have some extra heartbeats, we just call those extra heartbeats. I'm not going to go through the medical term for that. What you are maybe referring to, Kathleen, is something called atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. Atrial fibrillation is a irregular heartbeat, very common. Over the age of 65, one in four people will develop irregular heartbeat atrial fibrillation. Nothing to do with cancer, nothing that's just, as we get older, we've had hearts in our bodies for 65 years. It's the only heart we have, if you haven't had a transplant. As you've been using this heart for 65 years, what happens with the heart is it becomes older, but it becomes more stiff. And as the heart gets stiff, the top part of the heart will say, you know what, I'm going to make this heart to become irregular. And so you start feeling the fluttering in the chest, and then you may develop this atrial fibrillation. Hmm, okay. Yeah. Are there any drugs that cause that, or is it just an aging thing? Both aging as well as drugs. So aging, for sure, as you get over the age of 65, one in four people are at risk of developing irregular heartbeats. And you always see these commercials on TV that talk about atrial fibrillation. Um, and then medications, there's a whole slew of medications that can cause it, including uh, chemotherapy drugs. They can definitely cause it. Okay. The one thing that I want the whole crowd to know is that atrial fibrillation, this irregular heartbeat, it does not reduce your lifespan. So people always get concerned, am I going to live shorter, Dr. Jassel, instead of getting to my 90s because I have this at 65, I'm going to pass away tomorrow. No, atrial fibrillation is a nuisance. You will feel horrible. Some people feel horrible because of the regular heartbeat. And the only concern that I have as a heart doc, if you have atrial fibrillation, is that you have an increased risk of having a stroke. And what we do is we put people on blood thinners, Kathleen, to make sure that if they have an irregular heartbeat of atrial fibrillation, that we reduce you from having a stroke. That's the biggest thing that we worry about as, as having that rhythm issue. Okay. Um, a question from a 77-year-old male that has... Um no atherosclerosis, but an aortic valve replacement four years ago. He says he likes to exercise hard, but wonders if occasionally he takes his heartbeat up to about 170. Is that dangerous? Correct. Okay, so atherosclerosis, the fancy word Kathy says, is just basically hardening of the arteries. So do you get narrowing of the pipes? This gentleman had no atherosclerosis. So I suspect that when the patient went for open heart surgery, they just had to take the valve out and put a new valve in, but they didn't have to do any bypasses or block any or bypass any blocked pipes because his pipes were fine. In terms of the valve itself, yeah, it doesn't matter if you have a tissue valve, which is um, either a, a mumu valve, a cow valve, 
or an oink oink valve, a pig valve. So we actually use pig valves or, or cow valves. They last about 10 years in your body, at which time we'll have to do another valve. If you have a metal valve, and I don't know what kind of valve our patient has, a metal valve will last for 30 years, uh, but you have to be on blood thinners for that for life. So those are the two types of valves we give to patients. In terms of uh, exercise, no. If you get your heart rate up to 170, great for you. 30 minutes, five days a week, not an issue. I have no concerns about patients who've had valve replacements and getting their heart rates up. You'll be fine. Oh, that's good to know. Um, another question from somebody that um, was uh, a breast cancer patient, patient, and then um, their, pa their cancer uh, was then diagnosed as metastatic. So she was on the doxorubicin for, um, for a while and then was switched to de dexrazone, zoin. Yeah. and uh, to protect her heart. So then she also switched to palbocicillib. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, my goodness, these words. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> Should she ask for a follow-up mug? I think that's the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, in terms of the medications you're on, the dexrazosone is the fancy word where it's a medication that helps protect the heart just like we're doing at the flax, just like we're doing at the exercise. So if that's what you're given, great. Uh, in terms of doing another MUGA scan, it would totally depend on when's the last time you had it uh, in terms of the MUGA scan. So if you've, um, or, an, or an echo and ultrasound of the heart, either imaging test, if it's been over a year to two years and you still have or on those medication, it probably would uh, be wise just to get that, just to make sure things are fine. I only order tests, reality speaking, if a patient comes to me or comes to the GP or a nurse practitioner and say, I feel tired, fatigued, short of breath, something clicks in my Sherlock Holmes brain says that there's something not right with this patient. I examine them because I'm an old fashioned Canadian doc. I'm going to use that thing called a stethoscope and see what's wrong. Do a heart tracing on you an EKG. And then once I've diagnosed you with having fluid in the lungs or you have heart failure, that's where I'm going to do the echo or the MUGA scan to confirm my suspicion that this is the diagnosis. Okay. We shouldn't be doing tests just as part of routine. We should be doing tests to help confirm what we're suspicious as as a healthcare team. Okay. Um, just another question about the atrial fibr fibrillation. Um, somebody asked, can exercise help prevent that? Yeah, great question. So again, uh, weight loss, um, exercise, 30 minutes a day, five times a week, stopping smoking. These are all really important things that will help your heart prevent it from getting stiff as we one gets older and um, prevents you potentially from getting atrial fibrillation. Once you develop atrial fibrillation over the age of 65, the chance of atrial fibrillation and regular heartbeat going away is very unlikely. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we're drawing to a, a close now, um, getting close to, to one o'clock. I do have um, a quote that um, I was given permission to share, and I just wanted to share that with you that um, Linda wrote to us last year after watching the webinar and taking the advice of Dr. Jassel. I had an echocardiogram done as I'm on a targeted therapy, which can affect your heart. My echo was not normal, and I will be seeing my oncologist about this tomorrow. If it hadn't been for the webinar, I would not have had this information, which can be considered life-saving. So I just wanted to thank you on behalf of Linda and on behalf of our other viewers for sharing your time and your expertise with us and because it's really valuable information. Yeah, no, I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and I think it's great, like just seeing 81 participants on a, on a Wednesday afternoon, taking your time to uh, share um with myself and Kathleen, all of our stories and your questions. I think this is fantastic because at the end of the day, the, you know, my wife and my two boys who are 18 and 15 say, dad, why do you do what you do? And I do it because of patience. I come every day to work at St. B here. Don't know what I'm going to be seeing, but it's the patients that we're looking after for. And reality is all patients, when they come and see us, you all have the diagnosis. You, we know that there's something wrong because that's why you've come to see us for our help and our expertise. And we're here as a team to figure out what we can do to make that diagnosis and really help you um, and help you, uh, you know, enjoy the years that we all have with our family friends.
Thank you, Dr. Jassel. And thank you to all our viewers for your excellent questions and for joining us again today. Um, if you could be so kind to complete our evaluation, we really uh, depend on your feedback to help plan our future webinars. And if you would like to be added to our email list, um, please contact me and let me know so we can keep you informed of anything that's upcoming. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Jassel. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everyone. Merry Christmas, everyone. Happy holidays. And I love the hearts that are coming up as a cardiologist. We got to talk to the Zoom folks to see how we can get some cancer um, emblems coming up as well. Do you see them, Kathleen, the hearts and the hands up? I hadn't seen it, but uh, nice. because... <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye now.